This episode of Belief Hole is brought to you by Sound Iron, a premium developer of virtual instruments for songwriters, composers, and sound designers. Creating instruments for the best composers and artists in media today. Coming up on this episode of Belief Hole. What we're going to be covering today, ITC, which is uh, instrumental transcommunication, it actually does work with time travel as well, in the sense that you are communicating with something beyond this plane, whether it's the next realm after, you know, life after death, or if it's another time or another reality, another dimension, whatever it is, using this medium of sound. You know, it's interesting too, if you believe that this is genuine, the idea that people that have passed over to this other side, right, this energy continues, maybe they are just in a new place as well and they're discovering it's just another dimension. Just another dimension. That's so just weird. What do you just like wake up after you die one day and you're just in this new world? Yeah. But it's still this other mystery. So you're with all these dead people and you're like, what happens next? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> we don't know. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. It does feel the more you look into this, you get a sense that whereas EVPs, it's freaky. You think about a ghost being in the room. You can hear it on playback and it's this kind of weird ghostly interaction. But with this kind of ITC stuff and the radio, you can almost picture two parties, both trying to communicate from one side to the other. Right. You're not just capturing a voice. They're in on the experiment with you. This is a really interesting quote. This is, believe, an audio analyst. He said, if you pay attention to these voices, to their sound, whoever spoke had no larynx. We can imagine a hole that grows to the size of a lion's mouth and diminishes into a tiny hole. It's something inhuman. Mm, creepy. So he was under the impression, or at least his idea was, people had inside of them infinitely smaller and smaller conscious entities. Little people. And there were swarms of these people that had duties and personalities and that they made up your macro personality. This is what Edison believed? <laughs> yeah. It makes me think of uh, your microbiome. You know how they say like when that changes, your personality changes? Yeah, well, that's because it's directly attached to your immune system. Yeah, but I... I like, I like to think that there are swarms of little people. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting to a doctor? <laughs> All right, let's move along. Conspiracy. Synchronicity. Sasquatch. Homunculus. Alien races. Satanism in Hollywood. MK Ultra. Tartaria. There's like a whole. I've been watching this one guy. That, Close the door, in. Jury. Close your door. What's the uh, inner earth disagreements? Ghost Dad. <laughs> I like that movie. Dogman. Bohemian Grove. Corey Feldman. Magicians mm-hmm. are demons. Specters. Spirits. Spirits. Sleep paralysis. Strange disappearances. Sky whale phenomena. Yes. Alternative history. Shadow people. Shh, quiet. I'm trying to say words with the mouth. It's getting dicey out there. Poltergeists. Oh, that's cool. Anunnaki. What is the moon? <laughs> Elf towers. I would never talk about. It. That's old. Y two K. Cover ups. Apocalyptic catastrophe. Vampire. 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 Yeah. Blow it up. Blow it up. Well, hello. Hello. Hi. Well, hello. Hello. My name is John. I'm Jeremy. I'm Christian. We are your beloved hosts of the Belief Hole podcast. Welcome into the hole. <sighs> yes. For another great episode. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. It could go horribly wrong. What if we just had a terrible episode? We should try it just to mix things up. No. We crush every episode. (laughs) So what are we covering today? Yeah, so this is an interesting topic. So we've done EVPs before, Mm -hmm. right? And everyone is familiar with the idea of voices in the white noise, Mm -hmm. right? That kind of idea. And it's made popular today with ghost hunters and that kind of thing. But in today's episode, we're going to cover the possibility of hearing voices almost more directly. Mm. Two-way communication between us and the spirit world. So imagine, for instance... Instead of using general recording instrument that we see now, recording voices in the white noise, imagine sitting down at the radio, tuning in a voice from the other side and having a two-way conversation back and forth. It sounds really out there, but this allegedly is what happened in 1949 with Marcello Bacci. And so he's one of the people we're going to talk about in this episode, but we're covering the idea of strange transmissions, voices from the beyond. Yeah, using radios, video equipment, 
That'll come later in the episode, but specifically frequencies, radio frequencies, basically allowing whatever is on the other side to manipulate right. frequencies to try to communicate with those still living. So sort of like an EVP, but these are a little bit more direct, right? Yeah. There's a movie based on this, like fairly recently, within the last 10 years, called Frequency, I think. That's time travel. There's another one, though, that maybe it's not white frequency. White noise? Is it white noise? That's EVPs, though. Oh, it is? Yeah. It's not? I swear there was one that was directly... Can we, oh, so maybe frequency was the time traveling Yeah, because in a way you're talking to someone who died, but it's because they're still living in the past. That's a great movie, by the way. Which actually, what we're going to be covering today, ITC, which is uh, Instrumental Transcommunication, it actually does work with time travel as well, in the sense that you are communicating with something beyond this plane, whether it's the next realm after you know, life after death, or if it's another time or another reality, another dimension, whatever it is, using this medium of sound and frequencies and and electronic equipment to tune that in and have a conversation. Yeah. It's a really interesting idea. And we've actually, when Chris and I were researching this, discussing the movie frequency, because there is a certain point in the story that we're going to be talking about here where all of these things seem to be happening in a certain time period. and, And the entities, quote, on the other side, suggest at one point that it's because Our world is at a particular place in this particular time, whether it's an alignment in the universe or whatever it is. This communication is allowed to happen just like in the movie Frequency. Like the veil is getting thinner. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. Frequency was the Aurora Borealis. I think the entities in some of these experiences discussed the idea of Earth energies or something to do with the Earth's magnetosphere or something. Just because I'm interested. Yeah. So when you said the Earth is sort of in this place where this makes it easier to happen, Mm -hmm. when did that happen? When did the one you're specifically talking about, what time frame was that? So this begins in the earliest one that we're going to talk about, and I think the earliest one, well, I'm not sure if it's the earliest one, but 1949 is when Marcello Bacci begins his work. Okay. When they said the Earth is in this time frame, was it a fairly long band of time? You know, were we talking thousands of years or a hundred years? Based on the stuff that we're looking at, it seems like... Well, because of electronic equipment, it was only been developed fairly recently, as far as in our timeline, right? Like maybe advanced civilizations had this and had this experience, but we're talking the time period shortly after World War II up until, as our story goes, and the stories that we'll communicate here, up until like the 90s. But there are people that still do this today. But there is a reason it's at one point that it did seem to start to break down, at least the groups that came together to start this communication. There were certain things happened that kind of started causing the groups to disintegrate a bit. And Maybe it's because the '90s was the last good decade. It was like I'm getting. They out They did of here. cite something about the hip hop music, and uh, <laughs> there's some good hip hop out there. Something about Keisha, and so then it started. Keisha's to break down. coming. <laughs> Got to get out. It just didn't work anymore. No, but it does seem like that there were things happening, and this happens too when you get. You know, we followed the David Wilcox in our lives and the Corey Goods, and there are personalities that can sometimes flare up and butt up against other personalities. And there are some groups that were in the ITC movement that seemed like, you know, some challenged other people's findings and there was there was more doubt and skepticism and that kind of deteriorated the mood and the uh, morale of the movement of communicating across the plane. And it seems like you do need a certain level of belief going in or at least open-mindedness and goodwill in order to make the communication happen. And there mm-hmm. were there was a point where they were getting a lot of notoriety and news and there were a lot of, you know, science folks, if yeah. you will, challenging. And then there were certain people that were doubting within the group, challenging other members and there were hurt feelings. And you're and, talking mm-hmm. about specifically- Like human stuff happens. Yeah, exactly. Human stuff. Yeah. You're talking specifically about the skull experiments. Actually, no. Which was, hopefully we'll get to it. I'm not sure if they broke down because of this, but there was, I think, in it. It's the name of the group, like something like International Network of Transcommunication or something to that effect. We'll have that in the show notes and we'll get into it later on in this episode, but I just wanted to touch base about that right away. But to answer John's question, yes, this whole story all starts, and we kind of touched on this in a previous episode, but it all kind of starts really with Edison, right? Yes. <laughs> yes, Art. Just because of specifically... <laughs> Thank you, Art. Art Bell is with us today. The, the, the recording medium itself, right? He was working on a spirit phone towards the end of his life. Yes. Which, yes. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> it's be, which we uh, all episode is going to so be happy con- confirming us. <laughs> I bring back the sound effects drops. I like it. Do you have any others? No, not really. <laughs> yes, where were we? Yeah, I don't remember what I was talking about. Oh, the, yes, the spirit phone. Yes, yeah, one, yeah, that's true. One of the things that you miss a lot. We did talk about that in a previous episode that Edison wanted to develop the spirit phone, which was a way to communicate with the beyond, mm-hmm. right? And he didn't believe in mediumship, right? He was pretty skeptical yeah. of all that stuff at the time. Yeah, actually, I have a quote from him if you want to hear well, sure. about the spirit phone. There. Yeah, let's start, let's start with him. This is interesting. This comes from the American Magazine, and he was being interviewed by Forbes, the actual guy. Oh, Forbes was a, was a guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, but this was an interesting interview, and it was towards the end of Edison's life in the 70s when he was trying to build the spirit phone. Makes sense. It's like, if I'm going to go, I want to be able to keep talking to you guys. <laughs> right. 
But to answer your question, yeah, it was more about, in his mind, it wasn't going to have to do with the silliness of, you know, mediums or weirdness or right. magic or anything. All right, this comes from the uh, October 16th, 1920 issue of the American Magazine. I've been, I've been a- at work. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. You monkey. You monkey. <laughs> I have been at work for some time building an apparatus to see if it is possible for personalities which have left this earth to communicate with us. If this is ever accomplished, it will be accomplished not by any occult, mystifying, or weird means, such as are employed by so-called mediums, but by scientific methods. If the units of life which compose an individual's memory hold together after that individual's death, is it not within the range of possibility that these memory swarms could retain the powers they formerly possessed and thus retain what we call the individual's personality after dissolution of the body? If so, then that individual's memory or personality ought to be able to function as before. I'm hopeful that by providing the right kind of instrument to be operated by this personality, we can receive intelligent messages from it in its changed habitation or environment. If the apparatus I am now constructing should provide a channel for the inflow of knowledge from the unknown world, a form of existence different from that of this life, we may be brought an important step nearer the fountainhead of all knowledge, nearer the intelligence which directs it all. Yeah, so that was his hope, that he would be able to create the spirit phone to communicate with people that have died and are hopefully still living, the consciousness survival kind of idea. Right, and this is kind of a, a side note, but he had a weird idea about what made up consciousness, Yeah, I was going right? to mention that. This is funny, John. Is it? So, well, you tell me, Mr. Giggles. Um, yes. <laughs> so in that quote, John, where he talks about these memory swarms. Yes. So he was under the impression, or at least his idea was, that people had inside of them infinitely smaller and smaller living sort of conscious entities. Little people. And there were swarms of these people that had sort of duties and personalities and that they made up your macro personality. So he thought... Kind of interesting. Nutty. It is. It will, I think what's really weird about it too, if you read it, it's very like... Did he do a lot of drugs? Edison? He was high on himself. This is what Edison <laughs> believed? I missed that yeah. part. Sorry, I was playing my, my clip. <laughs> I was dropping my sound effects. <laughs> I can only do one thing at a time. Yeah, do this. Listen to this. <laughs> so I just thought it was funny and because he, he breaks it down too. That's so weird. I mean, I just feel like I would have heard about that if that's what he Well, believed. I think they've kind of kept yeah, that right. out. Uh, they, yeah, they put yeah. You that. only hear a narrow view of history. I guess I was thinking about Einstein, not Edison. Oh. But this is Edison. Yeah. yeah. Thomas. Mm-hmm. The? The light bulb inventor. Not really. Not really. The light bulb stealer. Well, everyone thinks he invented the light bulb. Right. Not those that know. Not the Tesla fans out there. But, but anyway, I was, what I was saying was he believed also that these swarms of personalities, that there were like hierarchies of, you know, the bosses and the workers. And it's a little elitist when I read it, you know? Oh, yeah. So there's a hierarchy not only in the outside world, but within everyone's bodies. Mm-hmm. That would be weird. <laughs> Just getting things done. Well, it reminds me, it makes me think of uh, your microbiome. You know, they say like when that changes, your personality changes. Yeah, well, that's, that's kind because of feel, it, but, you have... Uh, little people inside you. Well, it has more to do with the fact that it's directly attached to your immune system. Right. But still, that it can, it's just to think that that can change, alter your personality based on your bacteria. Mainly because bacteria. you're not feeling as well. Yeah, but I... I, I like, like to, I I like like to, to think, think that there's swarms of little people. <laughs> Can you imagine sitting to a doctor? <laughs> yeah, but I like to think that there's swarms like of little people. Like we're having some immune problems because your gut lining is torn. No, well, no that's because of Steve and his crew. Yeah. And he's off on the well, eastern there are side. there many swarms of people in me and they're having at it with each other. It's making me very anxious. That's uh, fun. That's great. I mean, I don't completely discount that idea. Well, there are different life forms in your body that make up your body, yeah, right? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I don't think they all have personalities. Who but knows? They could. I mean, germs can have personalities, for all we know. We're just too darn big. Can't interact with them. They don't really have anything, you know. What? Like, I mean, we can see what TV they are. Guide they don't have any, like, brain function. We don't know that. We do. You could say that about trees, but trees talk to each other all the time. And I talk to them. It's a different kind of talking. Exactly. And that's my point. Doesn't mean they don't have thoughts or minds. John. Well, I think it our does. germs have minds. <laughs> I mean, it's very easy to see that they don't talk or feel like humans. It's a very it's rudimentary very yes. type of existence. Well, they could say that about whales, though. Whales, whales are very are intelligent. Way closer to us than trees, though. Well, but that's true. But our little germs could be wi- like little whales. Uh, all right, let's move you know along. <laughs> I think we need to. Move I think along. I'm making a lot of sense here, but we can <laughs> we can move on. 
Um, yeah. Get back to the swarms there of people are, that uh, live in our tummies. There are some interesting ideas about conscious entities living inside and that yes. being part of their world is the human body, but that's another, that's another episode. That would be a fun episode to do though. Yeah. I think. Let's move along. I like it. Jeremy's crazy corner. Dang. I got you, buddy. Oh, you got that? Yes, it's real. It's nice. live. <laughs> oh no. <Never> mind. <laughs> <laughs> so quickly taken away. Um, <laughs> So there was never a prototype found for this. Uh, from what we can tell, Edison never completed the spirit phone. Right. There's been alleged stories about him having scientists over to test a prototype, and we'll have a description of that in the show notes because that was kind of fascinating. Really? Yeah. But I'm not going to tell it here. But as a little preview, there is something about the spirit phone that does pop up in the future. Yeah. Posthumously. Edison's going to come back in later, and I don't want to spoil how. Edison will return. He shall return as we go through this story of the ITC development. Right. In and our communication reality. Communication with the dead. With the others. He, Edison's not... As we're, but what? Edison has not spoken his last word. That's all I'll say for now. Okay. Okay. Jeremy, do you want to take it away? We did touch on Jorgensen, our EVP episode, that really interesting guy who was recording bird songs, remember? And episode 23. Yes. Something about a titmouse. Something about a titmouse. And John laughed a lot at that part. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, just like that. <laughs> um, but check that out. We recap a journal entry that he had experiencing recording for the first time, basically the first EVP. Yeah. That's sort of the beginning of that phenomena. And what I wanted to say earlier in regards to the EVP thing, John, obviously that you set something down, record it, and you ask a question, and on playback, you hear potentially the voices of the dead. Whereas this two-way communication sort of thing is you ask in real time and it responds in real time through the transmission. So that's the difference between the EVP situation and this Instrumental transcommunication. Yeah, so that EVP is a form of that electric voice phenomena. But there is this one that I'm going to get into with Marcello Bacci. That's more the focus of the show, which is that direct, like, you ask a question, it talks right back, right? Mm -hmm. No need for recording, playback, listen through the whispers kind of thing. I did want to say that the father of EVP, who he's, he's often referred to as now, is uh, Frederick Jurgensen, as you mentioned. But just to break down his, to refresh on that story a second here, in 1959, the man who was to become a great pioneer in the recording of voice phenomena, Swedish film producer Frederick Jurgensen, captured voices on audio tape while taping bird songs, as you said. He was startled when he played the tape back and heard a male voice saying something about, quote, bird voices in the night. So here I tried to play in the of the rain Listening more intently to his tapes, he heard... Now, this is where it gets crazy. He heard his mother's voice say in German, Friedrich, you are being watched. Friedel, my little Friedel, can you hear me? Jurgensen said that when he heard his mother's voice, he was convinced he had made an important discovery. During the next four years, Jurgensen continued to tape hundreds of paranormal voices. He played the tapes at an international press conference and in 1964 published a book in Swedish, Voices from the Universe, and then another entitled Radio Contact with the Dead. So, yeah, accidental voice. And you hear this a lot uh, with different people that have gone on to further this experimentation is the first thing that they hear is the voice of their, their mother or close loved one who's passed on. Yeah, what's interesting about this too, unlike, you know, the EVP situation, there's a lot of scary stuff, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of like demonic sounding stuff or, you know, dead spooky ghosts. Get out! Right. With this sort of phenomenon, the two-way communication, it's more of a discussion where it seems like you'd be talking with someone who was alive. Other than the subject matter, what you're talking about with the person, it's not like you're talking to a scary dead person. You're just talking to someone who is not visible to you in this plane it's of existence. It's interesting, yeah. We, it's more interdimensional. Yeah, when you hear these back, or when you hear the conversations they have on the radio, and we'll play some clips coming up here, it does feel, the more you look into this, you get a sense that whereas EVPs, it's freaky, you think about a ghost being in the room, or an evil entity floating around you, and you can hear it on playback, and it's this kind of weird interaction, this ghostly interaction, haunting, if you will. But with this kind of ITC stuff and the radio, you can almost picture two parties, the one side, our side, talking through the radio to the other side who are, also have a radio or something of some kind. It's right. almost like this weird kind of equalization of the groups, both trying to communicate from one side to the other, which is just kind of interesting. It does feel, yeah, other dimensional, other realmy more than just, you know, this kind of ghostly, demonic, whatever it is. Right. You're not just capturing a voice of a dead person. They're in on the experiment with you. Right. And that's not to say like, you know, we don't know what this is. Right. We, we don't know if it's even real, but it, it's interesting to compare those phenomena. Oh, it's real. Uh, it definitely feels like there's something paranormal going on. That's all I'm going to say. Yes. Yes, indeed. <laughs> uh, thank you, Art. It's always keeping us moving. I love it. All right. Okay. Well, where, where we leave off? Remember, Chris? You talked about Jorgensen, right? Right. I just love his story. We talked about it in the EVP episode, and it's really cool to hear him in his own words, so check that episode out. But 
What I love about that is I love just the idea of this guy who's recording bird songs up in an attic somewhere and for the first time picks up. No one's ever thought that this is a possibility you could pick up people on tape mm-hmm. yeah. who had died. I love that idea that someone's just recording bird songs. And then here's someone talking about birds in a different language that he's kind of familiar with. Just a cool idea. Yeah. And again, it's going to tie into Bocce's work with the radio, mm-hmm. uh, the Italian fella. And if we get to it in this episode, if not the expansion, we'll see where, how far we get. But the skull experiments, which are so fascinating. Yeah. There's some incredible phenomena with that, if if it's true. I mean, that's under we're hot gonna, contention. And we're going to get into that contention. Uh, but either way, fascinating stuff. Some really renowned researchers involved in that study and in those experiments that you could argue are some of the best evidence for life after death. So yeah. we'll definitely be getting into that. But go ahead, Jeremy, take it away. Yeah, so all this time, so Jurgensen, right, father of the EVP, had this experience in 1959. He's published about it, started bringing the subject to the forefront, or at least shedding some light on it. Little did the world know that just seven years earlier, 1952, the same experience had happened with two priests. Now, see, this I had not heard about. Yeah, this is interesting. Now, this is interesting because this didn't come out until the 90s, but it actually occurred in 1952. In the early 1950s, in Italy, two Catholic priests, Father Ernetti and Father Gemelli, were collaborating on music research. Ernetti was an internationally respected scientist, a physicist, and a philosopher, and also a music lover. Gemelli was a president of the Papal Academy. On September 15, 1959, while Gemelli and Ernetti were recording a Gregorian chant, a wire on their magnetophone kept breaking. I want a magnetophone. Exasperated, Father Gemelli looked up and asked his father for help. Oh, Father, help me to keep from breaking the wire. To the two men's amazement, his father's voice, recorded on the magnetophone, answered, Of course I shall help you. I am always with you. They repeated the experiment, and this time a very clear voice filled with humor said, But Zucchini, it is clear. Don't you know it is I? Father Gemelli stared at the tape. No one knew the nickname his father had teased him with when he was a boy. He realized then that he was truly speaking with his father. So this was the first official EVP. Interesting. But it wasn't because of his situation, being a priest and, you know, his colleagues. And Mm -hmm. and he wasn't even sure, like, is this this a sin that I'm communicating with the dead? And the interesting thing at this point, you know, because he's a Catholic priest, he goes to the Pope and the Pope tells him, essentially, it's all good. You're doing something objective. The voice that you're recording, it's all factual and truth. You're not conjuring. Essentially, if you're not conjuring or using mediums, you're recording a voice that's out there. And this is coming from our reality, which is God's reality, this kind of thing. So it's it's not wrong in a sense, but interesting. So this priest held onto this until he died, basically, or until he was very old in the 90s, In his later years, yeah, in the 90s. He's 40 years later, he discussed this, right? Yeah, but remember that name. Jamelli, because that comes back. You'll see this thing happen as we talked with Edison. There are some surprises later on after the death of these people who were studying this field that maybe they did make it back to... Well, you're just going to spoil well, okay, it all, I'm not going to say anything, but <laughs> it's, it's all about transcommunication, right, with the other side. So if you are interested in the past, maybe there's a voice that will come through in the future. Again, you're just ruining I'm just, it I'm foreshadowing. That's all I'm doing. <laughs> I'm not ruining it. Yeah, that's fascinating. I hadn't heard about the priests. Mm-hmm. Very cool. So this takes us to Marcello Bacci, right? Yeah, so as we mentioned, Friedrich Jürgensen, the father of EVP, well, he went on to inspire a lot of folks in this field. And one of them, probably the most well-known, arguably, is Marcello Bacci. And this, it's hard to find stuff on him. This is what's crazy, man, is like, uh, first of all, if you go on YouTube and you try to find anything from Marcello Bacci or his work or a lot of ITC stuff, oddly, most of it's in Spanish. And there are a few people, I think, in Latin America that are covering this stuff. They're definitely into the paranormal down there in a, mm-hmm. in a kind of a different angle. I mean, there's some literature in English, but it's all academic. A lot of it's academic periodicals, things but like research But there's no, papers. like, you think, I searched all podcasts on CastBox, which is the podcast app that we recommend. There's no episodes about Marcello Bacci and his work with ITC and communicating with the other side and his radio. He's been doing it for over 50 years Yeah, or there's something. not a lot of blogs out there either. there's a reason for that? I think it's just, well, there's just a trans- unknown. Yeah, something? there's a translation problem. Like the, the oh, documentary okay. I got a lot of this information from was all in Italian. And because I speak fluent Italian, I was <laughs> able to <laughs> actually. No pepperoni and. There's a YouTube. Italian, so though. the YouTube video I will link in the show notes, the documentary. It is in Italian, but a YouTuber, she's the only one that I've seen do it. I think it's a she, Shiva Rose. 
translated it. So we'll link that in the show notes. But so there's information that just hasn't really broken the language barrier, it seems like. There's one other documentary that we'll link mm-hmm. in the show notes that did cover a little bit of Bocce, yeah, Bocce's work. It's a documentary about the skull experiments. It's called yes. Afterlife Investigations. And they have a, a little bit on Bocce in the beginning of the documentary. Yeah, but not a lot out there other than that. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this episode because I do think it is fascinating whether you believe he's talking with the dead or th- there is another reality that he's communicating with or whether you believe it's all demons or whether it's all, you know, whatever it is, it seems like it's it's probably some of the best evidence for the paranormal when it comes to communicating with non-visible entities. Right, and because Bocce has been doing it for so long, he's had a lot of people come over and try to expose him as a fraud yes. or debunk him. Uh, but no one's been able to. They've put him under rigorous scientific investigation. They've done experiments unplugging oh, yeah. unplugging the radio, taking the tubes out after unplugging the radio, putting the radio in basically a Faraday cage. And with all these experiments, the voices still come through, but only when he's around. Yeah, they've had different technicians from different academic scientific backgrounds, government agencies analyze what he's doing when he's reading or communicating with these entities. They've taken the tubes out. They've put in, like you said, like a Faraday cage, and they've even monitored the the different kinds of waves, radio waves, magnetic waves going in and out. Yeah. And it seems after all this analysis that even though he's using a radio to communicate and they're coming through the radio, uh, it's not the radio. He's actually changed radios throughout yeah. his experiments. It seems that whether he recognizes this to a degree or not, that he is acting as a kind of medium in the sense that the conduit. It's working when he's there, and it doesn't matter what system he's using, but for whatever reason, it works when he's there, and I don't know if it would if he isn't. Right. You know and I mean? John, you'll appreciate this. So a person died. A girl came through, one example, and she's talking to her mother. They record this coming through the radio. They compare it to a recording of her while she was alive talking. Mm-hmm. And using software that the FBI recommends, it was a 97% match on vocal pattern. And just one example of the ways that they try to figure out if he's faking this. Mm-hmm. And it's usually crowds of mothers there that are trying to talk well, to their children. not just mothers. It's just, that's what I've seen a lot of is mothers talking to their children, other people too, obviously, husbands and wives, but loved ones. I'm sure there are dads as well. But my point being right. that they recognize the person that's passed over. They recognize them as yeah, the this person is, they knew. And, you know, it's very emotional. I'm going to read a, a firsthand account so you can get a feeling of what it's like to be in the room. But I wanted to say that, yeah, generally, you're right, it's between 20 and 100 some people in a crowded room. He's got his hands on the radio, caressing the radio, doing whatever. Voices eventually will come through, and he doesn't engage with anybody in the audience. It's a voice that comes through that'll say mama or something like that. And then some random person in the audience will recognize that voice and then have a conversation. And that's how it happens. It's like these voices, whatever they are, coming through on the other side, whether it's the trick or it's truthfully the spirit of whoever, it's that kind of communication between the two Bocce is simply just there as a technician. Right. And when people come in, they don't tell anybody about who they are, where right. they come from. There's no like background check. Yeah. And we'll get into some of that. But yeah, let's go ahead. Let's do this reading of what it's like to be there. And then we'll play some sound examples so you can actually hear what, okay. what it sounds like. All right, John. Oh, actually, would you want to read this experience? Sure, because I'm good at reading. You're good at reading. Yeah. So to put you guys in the room, inside Marcello Bocci's room in Grosseto, Italy. Cool name. Right. Um, small town in Italy. This is what it would be like to be there. This is a description that comes from Irvin Laszlo, and this is in the article titled An Unexplored Domain of Non-Locality Toward a Scientific Explanation of Instrumental Transcommunication. Say that 10 times fast. This is from April 7th, 2007. I am sitting in a darkened room in the Italian town of Grosseto, together with a group of 62 people. It is evening and there is not a sound other than the static of the shortwave band of an old-fashioned vacuum tube radio. I am sitting immediately behind Marcello Bacci, who for the past 40 years has been hearing voices on his radio that seem to belong to recently deceased persons. The people who come to his regular dialogues with the dead are convinced that they can contact this way the son or daughter, father, mother, or spouse whom they have lost. Bachi is touching with both hands the wooden box that houses the radio, caressing it on both sides, at the bottom and on the top, and speaking to it. Friends, come, speak to me. Don't hesitate. We are here, waiting for you. But for a full hour, nothing happens. As Bachi plays with the dial, the radio emits either the typical shortwave static 
or conveys one or another shortwave broadcast. But then there are sounds like heavy breathing or like a rubber tube or pillow being pumped with air. Bachi exclaims, at last! He continues to move the dial, but there are no longer shortwave transmissions coming through. Wherever he turns the dial, the radio transmits only the sound of breathing. Bachi talks to the radio, encouraging who is ever breathing to talk back to him. Soon voices are coming through on the air. Indistinct, hardly human voices, difficult to understand, but they speak Italian and Bachi understands. The first voice is that of a man. Bachi talks to him and it answers. Bachi tells him that next to him sits someone whom the voice would know. Who is he? The voice answers. As the noted ITC researcher, Father Francois Brunet is known in his native France. Brunet, who sits immediately behind Bachi, asks, With whom am I speaking? The voice discloses that it is Father Emeti, a friend and associate of Father Brunet, who died not long ago. Through the radio, Father Brunet and Father Emeti talk for a while. And then Bachi, who continues to touch the radio, says, Do you know who else is sitting here just behind me? A different male voice answers. Irving. He pronounces it as one does in Hungarian or in German with the E as in extraordinary and not as in earth. Bachi asks, Do you know who he is? And the voice answers. He is Hungarian. The voice then gives my family name. It is pronounced as Italians sometimes do, Laszlo, and not as Hungarians, with a soft S as Laszlo. Bachi places my hand on his, and his wife places her hand on mine. Bachi tells me, speak to them in Hungarian. I lean forward and do so. I say how happy I am to speak with the person, or persons on the other side. I ask, who are you, and how many are you? The answer that comes is indistinct, but I can make it out. It is in Hungarian. A voice adds, the Holy Spirit knows all languages. We are all here. I ask, thinking of the seemingly strenuous breathing that preceded the conversation, is it difficult for you to talk to me like this? A woman answers, quite clearly, and in Hungarian. I say, it was not easy for me to find this way of talking with you, but now that I could do it, I am delighted. Interesting. Bachi then directs attention to the others in the room who are waiting to communicate with their loved ones. He is not identifying anyone by name, just recalling that there are people here who would like to communicate. The voice offers a number of names, one after the other. The person named speaks up, can I hear Maria or Giovanni? Sometimes a younger voice comes on the air and a person in the room gives a shout of delight and recognition. And so it continues for about a half an hour. There are breaks taken up by the sound of air rushing as in heavy breathing. Bachi explains they are recharging themselves, but the voice comes back. Finally, they are gone. Bachi moves the dial on the shortwave band but only static and some shortwave broadcasts come through. He gets up and the room lights are switched on. Pretty incredible. Yeah, it's cool. Interesting, huh? To me, one of the coolest parts about this is just that it's just so, it's such an unusual idea that you can imagine that there are these people on the other side that are also trying to communicate. And it is, it's this cooperation between, yeah. it's not, it they're not the all-knowing beings. It's an interesting beings. visual picture. Yeah. yeah. Like both standing like, but no one can see each right. other. And like, is it hard for you to communicate? It was hard. It's, we have some obstacles, but how is it for you over so on your it side? Is, it's a fascinating concept, especially the medium, the technology. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. that's all it is. It's a transducer. It's tra like, it transduces on the physical level. 
it takes a radio signal and converts it through the speakers and, yeah. tr- and changes the energy. But it's like a short circuit of that, which is allowing the voice of these deceased people to use it as a transducer for people to hear it. Yeah. It's interesting you say that because later in the episode, we'll talk about a certain voice from the other side who actually gives a design schematic to increase that that potential? The potential, like the transducing, yeah. The progress. Progress, there's actual like schematic that is transcribed from the other side saying, this is how we might be able to do this better. And then they put that into operation on this site and they get better results. Hmm. Fascinating stuff. But I wondered how you look at that as a, you know, sound it, engineer. It's interesting, yeah. This article that this came from, this, this story, firsthand account I just read from, we'll have that in the show notes. And if you guys are interested, it goes on. It's fascinating because it talks about the physics of it. Right. It talks about, explanations from physics and i just will briefly mention the two keywords i saw non-locality right which kind of is the similarity of spooky action and distance and the deep dimension they call it which is the concept of an inherently unobservable field or dimension that subtends the manifest world of three-dimensional space and one-dimensional time it talks about the idea that essentially we have this body but we also have a light body oh right yeah. as people say or you could call it consciousness or soul that exists in a different kind of material reality energy uh but it but it is a copy of your physical body right people see like uh apparitions or that kind of thing that's what they're seeing is that that extra layer of you right and the idea that yeah when you die and some of these from the other side these voices have suggested that when you're severed from your physical body you still have the appearance of yourself just in light form mm-hmm. and, that, and that's when that part of you your consciousness soul leaves the physical body and moves to their realm where they're communicating to you from now. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting to complete that picture with this theory. And it's it's hard too with the subject because a lot of the terms get into what sounds more like new agey, like light body, things right. like that. Right. But they're yeah. just words that are trying to express. Yeah, they're, just, they're kind of loaded expressions exactly. at this point. Yeah. But it is the greatest mystery of all time. This is true. What happens when you die. And why not look into it? Like as a scientist, this well, is the most yeah, exciting but, idea. Well, yeah, I don't understand why it's so... Taboo. You, yeah, it's like... Because Out you can't all prove the it. things. Well, we, they don't know that That's because true. they've never really spent much time on it. Maybe they're afraid they will find out the truth. Maybe. Actually, if, before we go to break, I have a great clip. It's a guy who's involved in our upcoming story about the school experiments. And he's a renowned biologist and also part of the ISP research organization. You'd be familiar with him, John, from our animal EVP episode. Oh, yeah. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake. Kind of remember him? Oh, yeah. Morphic Fields. Yep. Yeah, he has a great quote here that I grabbed that, responding exactly to what your question is there about you know, his opinion on science and why we're not looking into these things. Also, I mean, I feel like the government has done so many studies. If you think about MK Ultra and the oh, LSD, CIA. psychedelic studies, mm-hmm. like they have to know there's a whole world beyond our five senses. I'm sure. I just think that on some level, we are a controlled population. Yeah. That's just... Well, that's yeah, the other side of our show we don't get into much we anymore. We don't but, talk about it that much, but... It's a fact that throughout history, governments just try to control people. It's right. been going on since the beginning of time. And the more informed, and also, if you were not afraid of death, if you knew that this life went on, all the petty problems of the world, people would get along a lot more. Yeah, it'd be harder to control people through fear. Right. Right. If you believe there's more after this life. Yeah, and even <laughs> speaking of, like, the, they kept a lot of the psychedelic experiments secret for generations, decades at least, because what does that do if you allow a population to realize that it's, it's not this evil thing to have these experiences where you expand your mind, you start to lose your control over those people, you know? Yeah, and once people realize we're more than this body, mm-hmm. you know... More than your tax return. Divisions and stuff start to feel kind of petty right. after right. a well, while. They, there's always that statement that's made too that, you know, why is alcohol legal and right. mind-expanding drugs are illegal. It's because those drugs make you think about the world you're in, yeah. challenge ideas. Oh, absolutely. Alcohol makes you more content. Like, oh, I'll just have a drink after work. It'll it's a little, fine. a little easier to pay my taxes. You go deeper into this world. <laughs> exactly. But psychedelics have been known, especially things like MDMA and certain mushrooms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Psilocybin. DMT, ayahuasca. have changed people so dramatically. Like, they get rid of their addictions. Mm-hmm. Depression. Their fears in life. You know, deep trauma that they've had in the past. Fear of death. All that stuff has the ability to transcend. Yeah. And finally, that's kind exactly. of, they're, they're having studies, at least in the scientific community, outside of, you know, governmental agencies, but that's at least in the mainstream is being talked about, discussed as possible ways to treat people who are fear of death, terminal patients, you mm-hmm. know, they're realizing that this is a valid way to help people see that death is not the end. Right. Yeah, exactly. That's what I was, I think I was thinking about that. Yeah. I know they've used certain things like that to right. help people deal with the end of life stage, mm-hmm. which is fascinating and Definitely. good. But yeah, play this one quick clip and we'll head out. So before we go to break, 
this is Rupert Sheldrake's thoughts, uh, some of his thoughts on materialism that he discusses uh, in the documentary, The Afterlife Investigations, that we're going to get to later. But th I think this is very appropriate. So let's let this take us to break. Most scientists still refuse to even consider the possibility that consciousness might survive death. Dr. Rupert Sheldrake, the internationally renowned biologist and skull investigator, offers an explanation. There's a dominant materialism in science that grew up in the 19th century. It's become part of the culture of science, but it's really a dogmatic belief system rather than a testable theory. What this means is that scientists have become completely focused on the things they can both measure and replicate in labs. Within science, based on a materialist point of view, the mind is the brain. So anything that suggests the mind might be more than the brain goes against the theory, and therefore most scientists don't want to know about it. Yeah. Uh, Interesting. Specifically about Sheldrake there, that idea of, we've talked about this all the time, is the brain the producer of consciousness, which mm -hmm. materialistic approach, the brain creates consciousness, your identity, who your you are, brain your is your, is your, your mind. Right. right, or the other side of the coin, which I think we all lean way more towards is the idea that, you know, is, is it maybe the receiver of consciousness mm -hmm. and that it is the limiter, the, you know, that allows you to enjoy this three-dimensional existence. Um, but I thought that was a good place to end it to answer that question about the directions of science investigation. But let's take a break. Yeah, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, guys, we're going to play some actual clips so you can hear what it sounds like from the other side through Bocce's Spirit Radio. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome back. I want to hear what these people that have crossed over, what, what it sounds like to hear them come through on the transmission on Bocce's kick-ass radio. Yeah, so we'll hear the actual voices uh, in a moment here. They will be in Italian, so Italian listeners out there, you're welcome. And everyone else, I'm sorry, but uh, that is the language of the dead. Nine so, Italians are going, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I did want to mention, though, that the story that uh, John had just read previously before the break, it was interesting one of the things I noticed is the heavy breathing, the rushing of air in between long phrases mm -hmm. that Bocce referred to that as, he said they were recharging themselves. Oh yeah, what was that about? I'm guessing that it's whatever state that they're in, there's indications that it's it's not space-time like we know it. It's a different kind of existence and that they have to concentrate to communicate. Right. So you get that, and then the communication, just interesting kind of perspective yeah. on that. Well, it's interesting because the skull experiments that we're going to do probably mostly in the expansion episode Really cool stuff, but it reminds me of that because the communication with these entities that are coming through and showing some pretty fantastic things, like crazy light phenomena in the room, actual apparitions of these beings. Disembodied hands. Touching people, yeah. disembodied hands. No touching. No touching. <laughs> Soft touches. Soft touch. I was waiting for that. <laughs> nice. Light balls of people hold their hands, it buzz around. Really cool stuff, but one of the things they talked about was, and this is one of the reasons why these things get so controversial, is because a lot of the mediums will have these dark room seances where you're not allowed to have light on. Right. And of course, that invites a lot of skepticism. Obviously, you could say, well, obviously, if you want to do things in the dark so people can't see what you're doing and really pull the wool over people's eyes, that's why you want it dark. According to what, at least in this case, the spirits were saying was to create energy to produce these things in, in full light would take years to develop right. this with the alive team they're working with. So the spirit team, as they're called, which is kind of a cheesy name, but they're saying if we do it in the darkness, we can do this within a few months, get this project moving as opposed to, you know, well, so who you, knows? Yeah, but, if you think about it as light energy, you see things by light reflecting on it, right? right. Or it's producing light. So if you have to create something from an, another realm, manifest it, the brighter it has to be, I'm sure the more energy it's going to take, the harder it is. So it, it does make sense that in a dark environment, it'd be easier to see these yeah, kinds of it's things. it's like glow in the dark. You exactly. can see, you know. Or a projector. It'd be a waste of a glow stick if we had them in here If right you now. have a projector that has like 500 lumens, like not a lot of light energy, all the windows blocked out, then you can see it. If you have 5,000 lumens, you know, you can have some little bit of residual daylight left, have a window open, yeah. you can see the image. Right. More power. So yeah, it's an interesting look at it. So last thing I want to mention about that reading that story, uh, if you remember the beginning, 
The writer had mentioned that Bocce had tried for an hour to get the voices to come through, and he does it regularly at 7.30 every night yeah. whenever he does the, uh, the communications. No fee. Of course. And that was another thing, too. If you want to be skeptical, absolutely. But what does Bocce get from this? He's been doing it since the early 50s, late 40s, and he doesn't charge a penny. He's never made any money. He's had very little notoriety. I mean, maybe one documentary in Italy, and I saw one from the UK, but I haven't seen it. He's nowhere on YouTube. There's just nothing he's getting from this and been doing it for so long, except if you want to say like local attention. Right. Yeah, in fact, right now he's, if he's still alive, I'm not sure that he is, but he was seriously ill and poor. Yeah. The last I looked. There was like a charity thing for him. Yeah. Yeah. So this is not for fame and fortune. Um, and he's been dedicated to it. So it's just, it's an interesting story, but to my point, 7.30 every night. And at this time, he waited an hour trying to get them to come on. And what's interesting, and this says something about maybe time for us related to the other side, is uh, that... Not long before that reading, Europe had shifted from winter to summertime, and the time change occurred. Hence, 8.30 p.m. was previously 7.30 p.m., the exact time the voices manifested themselves. So it appears that the voices were on time, and Bocce had just arrived an hour too early from his usual time. In other words, the voices were regularly awaiting Bocce's nightly thing, but since the time change, he was arriving an hour early trying to do it, and they weren't ready yet. Just oh, a weird, weird kind of like practical yeah. thing. You know what I mean? Interesting. Like how the voices know to be there an hour early. The fact that they were late almost lends credibility to the fact that they weren't in communication as like a hoax. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Kind of. <laughs> Did you get that? So there was the seasonal time change. So Bocce came earlier because they set their clocks back, basically. Yeah, he and came. the spirits came at the same time they were supposed to because they're not following the time change. Right. Yeah, well, that makes sense. But I'm, what I'm saying is evidence that if oh. it was a hoax, they wouldn't probably wouldn't think of that. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah, That's yeah. just kind of an interesting just, anecdotal interesting. Did thing. Did you look that up? Did you figure that out? No, this out? was a, an aside in the, that article. Oh, okay. Um, interesting. But yeah, let's, the let's, details. The details that matter. So we're going to get to these clips here. Uh, now, if you pay attention, there are a couple of technicians that had, uh, had kind of, and you'll hear this in the clips we're about to play, but there were some audio technicians and other, quote, experts or observers that uh, had noticed a couple of characteristics of these voices that you'll see. Uh, one man, I don't have his name here, uh, said, quote, if you pay attention to these voices, to their sound, the words coming from the radio seem to accelerate and deaccelerate at times in each phenom. Right. It never has the same speed. It seems that the voices are being sent as energy packs. It seems as if the senders who speak live in a timeless and spaceless area trying to adapt to our system. That's kind of an interesting way to look mm. at it. Uh, and I think the next guy, this is uh, definitely an audio. Who's that guy? I didn't get his name. It's in the documentary. We'll look okay. at the show notes, but it's Italian, so I didn't is pick up every detail. Is he a technician or? I believe so. This next guy definitely is. And this, this is a really interesting quote. This is, I believe, an audio analyst. And uh, he said, and this is translated from Italian, so it's rough, but imagine. Whoever spoke had no larynx and an abnormal acoustic flow, but it was something that closes and opens in a certain speed in abnormal dimensions. We can imagine a hole that grows to the size of a lion's mouth and diminishes into a tiny hole. It eats children. <laughs> That's close to what the quote is. The next line of the quote was, it's something inhuman. Mm, creepy, I should have waited one more second. <laughs> <laughs> it eats children. That's creepy. I hope that's not true. Uh, who knows what these so things are. So the deceased on the other side, whatever their mouth is doing or whatever speaking they're doing, if it were in our dimension, you could have visualized it as this small hole opening up to the size. This is a, an audio technician who's describing right, like, how this... You'll see in the documentary, if you guys check out the show. How do you measure that? You know, he's on a computer with software. He's analyzing the sounds. I don't know, John, you have a better idea. If, if you could pick that up from analyzing sound, but basically the ducts in the larynx, it's not like a human's... Something to do with the shape of the sound or something is coming from much... It moves dynamically the okay. size of the... Whatever it's coming out of, if that Visually, makes sense. I don't know, but... I feel like, I don't know. I'd have yeah. to see the waveform. Yeah. And you can check out the documentary. Do you have a clip? Think. Yeah. Go ahead, John. This first clip here, this is, we'll have to translate the clip for the listener, but they'll be able to hear the what okay. the voices sound like. But the, you'll hear in this that the guy saying at the beginning of this clip in Italian, essentially that the nature of the voice starts mechanical and becomes more fluid. And John, if you can translate as you see the translations, um, but you'll hear, you guys will hear the voices coming through the radio. So we'll just see, we'll see how this works. This is clip one. All right. Here we go. Lo sappiamo da tutto il bene che puoi fare. Controllati in tutto, senza lamento. Accontentati di quello che hai. Was that the spirit or That's the... the spirit talking. That is the spirit talking though? Okay. Lo sappiamo da tutto il bene che puoi fare. 
That's really the spirit. That's a very clear... Yeah. Beautiful soul, we know all of the good that you can do. Stay in control without lamentation. This sound guy. Exceptional. They are changing and becoming more fluid like human voices. They no longer have that impulsive character. They are evolving. This is fascinating. It's real. That's all for that clip, I think. Yeah, crazy. That's what's so fascinating about the know story. If it's real. What's crazy? I thought I'd find a bunch of like debunking stuff uh-huh. online or whatever. It just doesn't exist. So this guy's still not doing this anymore, right? I have to double check, but he last I read he was seriously ill. Yeah, he looked old in that clip. And right, this and was it's a from while the nineties. Yeah. yeah, but yeah. So the ghost that, or the spirit, whatever it is, on the other side, is saying, "Beautiful soul, we know all of the good that you can do. Stay in control without lamentation. Be content with what you have." Oh, that's encouraging. And uh, and then the guy that you heard after that was saying, like, he's describing what's happening to the voices that are coming through. Is mm-hmm. they start very mechanical, and it's almost like they get their footing and become a more fluid. Interesting, yeah, because so it's not really their voice then, it sounds like. It's more like an interpretation. It's not like they're speaking with vocal cords. And that's what the analysts we quoted earlier were saying, is like it doesn't work with the way that a normal larynx would work. It sounded like a normal voice, though. Right. Well, there's the disturbance of the radio. Like Maybe that's what the guy's referring to with how it doesn't sound human. Well, it's coming through a radio and it's it's fuzzy. It's It seems... Um, Wurbly. Truncated and broken. But it is weird how it does seem to organically turn into more fluid. Yeah. And as you hear more of these clips, you'll hear that it's broken up at first and then it comes together and then it's solid. It'd probably be easier to tell if it was in English too I was just going to say that. Right. It'd be easier also, I think, to feel how authentic it sounded. Yeah. It feels more authentic to me it because it is in Italian. It though. I mean, it did sound like it had emotion in it. Right. You know, it didn't sound robotic to me. Yeah. Like it wasn't like meow, 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 right, meow, meow, meow. right. Well, it's I do. Like, duh, 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 duh. Yeah, it's a human That's great impersonation. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. You know, there's a question as to if you're going to be skeptical and say like, well, is someone projecting these live? Because a lot of it's direct response to questions and these kinds exactly. of things have to, to, to people in the room. So there'd have to be someone with knowledge of the people in the room in another room using some kind of remote generator to radio the signal to the speaker itself. Because as we said earlier, in some of these experiments. The tubes were moved. There was actually a guy, a technician, a friend of uh, Bocci's who was there but didn't believe him and said, if I take out the tubes and it works, I'll eat the third tube because there's like three tubes in this radio. So he takes it out. He was an audio technician, yeah. He takes them out and of course, the sound keeps coming through even after all the tubes are gone. It's not even powered anymore. And he doesn't eat the tube, obviously, because it's made of glass. But the point being that he was stunned that how, how does this work? And then you had the FBI had done studies well, the FBI credited software. Oh, that's right. It was their software. 97% matches on right. a lot of these. So books. we can't say for sure that a government body looked at it. Right. But, but yeah. That, that oh, you bet they did. <laughs> they just didn't tell us about it. <laughs> they probably know about it. They probably have agents on the other side. <laughs> but uh, way through. They got to tax the are. dead, you know? Yeah. Anyway, so that's interesting. So Tax would, the dead. Yeah. Tax the dead. That sounds like a book. It does. Okay. So this next clip, John. Oh, this is one of the interesting clips where I think... You may have to translate this one. Well, we'll see. This is an example of where voices speak in their own language to their loved ones. So you'll hear in this clip that the voice speaks in German directly to the documentary filmmaker who's filming this documentary, who doesn't know Bocce before all this. A voice comes on. He doesn't recognize the guy's name. He says, I'm whatever he says his name is. Um, You'll hear it in the clip. And he says, basically says, greetings. We're happy to have you here. But he speaks in German and Bocce doesn't know German. But the documentary filmmaker is very familiar with German. Right. So it's just, he's speaking to him in a language that Bocce wouldn't know. And it's almost like the spirit, if you want to call it that, is uh, trying to authentically verify the transmission by using a language that Bocce doesn't know, but the filmmaker is directly familiar with. Right. What's interesting, this uh, on s- subtitles, it says on the screen before I'm actually playing the clip, it says, I notice that the voices never pause. They are continuous, not like a human voice where we pause, breathe, and continue. Yeah. So I had that in the notes too. I've skipped it, but that's a great point is like, they don't need breath like we do. Well, they're, it's not coming from their vocal cords. Exactly. Right, you know? so that's what's so fascinating. It's like all these little minute, legit. yeah, these little minute attributes. Like one person said earlier, it's like they are sending energy packs. That's what their voices are coming uh-huh. in. They're not being pressed through breath. Similar with like channelers, I feel like. They're just getting downloads of information. Kind of. I see what you mean. It's, like It's not quite the same thing. Right. But I thought of the energy information mm-hmm. packets as Like it of, just comes in through you. And, yeah. and that's an interesting point too, because I don't know if we mentioned this yet, but uh, Bocce... Bocce ball. He is referred to as a uh, as a medium, not because he speaks in voices or anything yeah. like that, but because I mean that's what it essentially is. He's he's the bridge between the two worlds. Exactly. Yeah, because yeah, he changes radios and it still works. Hmm. I think he used initially used a radio from 
One of the world wars. Yeah, World War II. So World like War II. a World War II radio. That's it have to be, yeah. And it was, it was very mechanical because back then it was very rudimentary, mm-hmm. just communication. And then when you got a nicer, bigger radio with loudspeakers, it still worked. I wonder how this translates to like digital compared to analog technology. You know, what's funny is I was listening to episode 23 of ours mm-hmm. about EVPs and we got into that debate. We talked about the oh, idea yeah. of like magnetic tape, magnetic tape. Like, is there something to do with the tape itself or magnetic fields or the energy that's mm-hmm. used to communicate that where it doesn't work so well with digital? My gut feeling would be it would be easier to use analog. Right. But that's just a gut feeling. I don't know if that's true. Yeah. But there's something maybe just because it's more organic mm-hmm. than ones and zeros. Yeah. And you can manipulate with energy. There's like magnetism and. Yeah. I, you know, and I didn't grab this for this episode. I, I wish I had it now, but um, <sighs> people be, people be yelling, <laughs> Google it. Well, I don't want to take the time, uh, but we'll do an episode because I, I want to do an episode on this guy. But have you heard of John, the person who moved into that apartment or home and his dad gave him a Polaroid camera? Uh, it was like in the nineties, I think. Yeah. Maybe earlier, but he took just on a whim, because weird stuff was going on in his home, he took a picture of his bathroom door opening by itself. And he got this strange apparition kind of thing on his camera. Throughout the course of you know living in this place, at one point, he just happened to ask a question out loud when he was taking a picture of some weird phenomenon going on, and written on the Polaroid exposed image was the answer to his question. This went on for years where people would come over and ask questions to this thing and it would live in the moment, write answers on these Polaroids that were being exposed. It, but it just reminds me of this idea of yeah. like, there's something about the the physical the Ken magnetic Webster. tape. Was it Ken Webster? Okay, I'd love to do that episode. It's a fascinating story. It, this thing from the 16th century is communicating with his computer. It That's com- not com- what I'm talking about. Oh, did you have a Polaroid camera in the 1600s? Oh, but that, he, said this, about, he said this thing from the 1600s is communicating. He's talking about the vertical plane, which is another episode oh, yeah, I want to do. Oh, yeah, I thought that's what you were talking about. No, this is a, a, a man who was in his 30s, 20s uh-huh. or 30s, living in an apartment somewhere in Jersey okay. or something. Not as interesting as the vertical plane. Yeah, I, I tend to think the magnetism would have a lot to do with the ease of communication for some reason. It I don't seems know. more like, because you can open up a tape and you can physically carve a you know a message in, yeah. into tape. I mean, electromagnetism, it's just like... Those are the worlds that, you know, we use electromagnetic Those meters. Those are the forces, yeah. To detect if there's potentially... EMF meters and things. Right. Yeah. Whereas digital is just ones and zeros. I'm not saying it can't happen because I think it does. It's just trickier. You know, I mean, yeah. a lot of ghosts don't have technical degrees. Yeah, they're not uh, IT specialists. Right. So, so ITC, instrument transcommunication. Instrumental so, transcommunication. Yeah, to your point, John, there have been communications via computer, fax machines, all different kinds of electronic media. But the interesting one, Chris, that I would like to do an episode on that you brought up before is the vertical plane. Yeah, Pat got me a copy of that, by the way. Did he? Okay, so the basic idea of that story, John, Mm -hmm. a man by the name of Ken Webster lived in this home that was previously owned by a 16th century Englishman named Thomas Hardin, apparently, and he would leave messages for him on his computer. Stuff like, oh, your wife is a very fine woman. Wow. And And this uh, is when you could first have like a home computer. Yeah. It's not like, you know, everybody had laptops. I think he borrowed it from his office or his classroom or something like that, and it started appearing. We'll definitely do an episode. And that might have been more of a time communication through time, right? Yeah, I think so. But I just want to read this quote because this is from that. Apparently the Englishman had left this phrase on his computer one day, which said, what strange words you are speaking. So apparently you can hear him. Yeah. Although I must admit that I had only poor school education myself, you are a good person and you have a fantastic wife, but you live in my house. It was a big crime to steal my home. I think his wife is just leaving messages when he's sleeping. (laughs) You have a fantastic wife. Very strange. But anyways, that'd be an interesting story to do. Yeah. But yeah, getting back to this, John, uh, this clip, John, this, the spirit from the other side speaks to the documentary filmmaker in German, unfamiliar language to Bachi. So if you want to play that clip and uh, feel free to translate where needed. C'è dell'entità cordula si rivolge a me, il realizzatore di questo servizio. The voice of the spirit entity Cordula reports to me, the implementer of this documentary. Cordula mi è sconosciuta, mi parla in tedesco. I don't know Cordula, the voice talks to me in German. Lingua che conosco bene e che Bachi non parla. A language that I know very well, unlike Bachi, who does not speak German. The spirit. So this is the spirit speaking now. We salute you, Guido. I have been with your earthly life for many years. I am happy to know you. Greetings from Alan Cordula. I mean... The crazy thing about this is this 
looks like it was it what in the sixties or seventies? The film? Yeah, I think. 80s, the, I think. I think the film was black and white. I think the film was originally the nineties. It's black and white. I think it's in color. It was a color. The first one, it changed to black. Oh, and it white. might be an earlier. Well, it's the documentary filmmaker. Oh, I see you're saying it is in black and white. The film looks really old. Archive. Oh, this is from well, the archive. Regardless, okay. it's still in an era when it would be way harder to fake something like this. Oh, absolutely. Especially the process, like the vocal, the warbliness of it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I guess there's stuff that you could process the voice like that. But the time and money it would take in focus to do something like that, the dedication when yeah. you're not making money from this, they're not... Yeah, I mean, need a cast there's no people. way to know for sure, but right. it's interesting. It's There's definitely a lot of credibility just from what I'm seeing right here. <laughs> Another voice coming through. Mom, Marco. Who is Marco? Woman, hello, Marco. Can you answer me? Can you tell me if you're with dad? Marco, please. Yeah, Marco. 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 Mama, mama, mama. Yes, I am Marco. I heard you calling, Mom, Marco. Don't forget your son. He has manifested and is always waiting. Another voice. Franco. So they say their name and then they... Yeah. This bond is wonderful. Your wife is near you in a different way. God, I wish it was in English. <laughs> That's crazy. You can hear the people reacting in yeah. real time in the background. The emotion. Young voices come in, and that's when you get the most reaction because people hear, like, usually the parents. They're more identifiable when it's, I guess, a younger person. What, do they get older when they cross over? No, I just think that it's a younger... Oh, okay. Who died more recently, usually. Yeah. Right, so that when the parents hear their child on their side, they that's when you hear the eruption of emotion. Right. Like, oh, it's child. Well, yeah, that would just because... Of that fact alone, right. it's, a, it's more emotional. Chiara. I am Chiara. It has been two years. I want to know if you are aware of what I want to ask you. I am saying nothing, but you should know, Chiara. I think that's the end of that clip. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know if there was a response or not. A lot of times yeah. there isn't, you know what I mean? Like they get a, a piece of communication and then it's like there's not enough energy or whatever. And there are times where they have sessions where it's three hours and nothing comes through. So it's, you know, not a guarantee. I mean, you can tell by the the actual sound of it that it's like it's trying to come through. It's not just this clear right. manifestation, this voice like you're just talking. It's like trying to form, mm-hmm. you know? That's what's so fascinating is even their the conversation they seem to have back and forth is like, it's hard for you. Is it hard? For, it's hard for us. Is it hard for yeah. you over there? It's interesting. And in the other documentary, the afterlife investigations, they actually go to Italy, this group of mediums who are doing these, oh, the skull, the skull experiments. They go to Italy and actually meet with Bocce and then they have an experience there. And that that's interesting because then an English speaking spirit comes through. Oh yeah. You can hear the English. Hmm. So maybe we'll play that in the expansion. But, uh, it's interesting for sure. Oh, by the way, that guy with the Polaroid camera, John Huckert was his name. And we'll do Huckert. an episode. We'll bring that up at least in one episode because I love that story. Really interesting. Well, I'd like to hear it. Okay, then. So this next clip here, I don't know if this is all recorded at one time or it's from different... Because Bocce has hundreds of cassette tapes of recordings from over the years. So I don't know if these are some specific ones or if it was from one reading, but they're different voices. And it's kind of like Q&A of these entities, spirits, whatever, answering questions about what it's like on their side or about the communication process in general. Um, just translate whenever. Okay. This is Bocce asking, how do you form the voice? <laughs> Mystery brain and the discovery of another human featured frequency for a bioelectrical control. A lot of this comes out very kind of vague or not understandable. Not completely, yeah. And how much of that is the translation? The mystery there, too, if you see in the actual documentary, it says, in parentheses, incomprehensible, Uh which means 
it was garbled. They couldn't tell mystery what the word was before mystery. Of another human so something mystery, frequency. probably like it's a mystery, the brain. And again, you got to think this is not a voice. So it's right. like thoughts and probably random things trying to come through in a, in a comprehensible way. So you're going to get jumbled phrases potentially. And yeah, it's a good mystery point. brain and the discovery of another human featured frequency for a bioelectric... I mean, that kind of makes sense. It's just very weirdly worded. Right. If the first part was incomprehensible, might have said, it's a mystery. Yeah. And then the brain and the discovery of another human featured frequency for a bioelectrical control. In other words, whatever they're doing on that side has some sort... It's something human that connects both sides, some sort yeah. of biofrequency right. that allows you to communicate. Like there's got to be a connection, first of all, between yeah. two people. Maybe he was talking about Bocce. Like his specific human frequency allows them to communicate through this medium. Right. Well, they do say that... They at different points, I believe, they, they reference that the person or the medium or whatever, Bocce being the kind of technician in this situation, there has to be some kind of openness, connectiveness. If it's not the right chemistry, I guess, energetically, spiritually, whatever, with all the people there, if it's overly negative or there's emotional trauma problems, a lot of times that's when there is no activity at all. They can't communicate because it's just too chaotic. He seems like the right guy to do it. He's always like kind of caressing his radio. Yeah, he, he does stroke it. Yeah. Welcoming the spirits in. Should I keep going? Yeah, on let's play a couple more. How to study more in depth the science of this phenomena, what causes the activity, and from what energy everything comes. So it's like they're trying to figure that out too, it sounds yeah. like. Just fascinating. It's so weird to think about like that, you know, you've crossed over and they're trying to reach back to the other side too. It's like this, this split between the worlds and, and they're just as interested as trying to talk to this side as. Exactly. You no, know, it's interesting too. If you think about it, if you believe that this is authentic, that this is genuine, the idea that people that have passed over to this other side, right? This energy continues, your consciousness continues after death and this other side. It's an interesting concept because I think we think about the death a lot. We think about the dead. We think about spirits. We think they're in some way omnipotent. They know more than we do. They've mm -hmm. been given yeah, right. just by dying. Yep. It's interesting to think like if they're just as subject to the natural laws of God, the universe, everything, they cross over there. The mystery is not solved. Right. Maybe they are mm -hmm. just in a new place as well and they're discovering. Right. It's just another dimension. They have their own laws over there. And right. It's an interesting concept. The journey continues. Kind of sounds like it. I would say that these phenomenon signal incomprehensible. <laughs> Trying to pick up information on short waves, I refer to the world we live in. Is that still the spirit talking? Mm hmm Oh, weird, so. I'm not sure what he means by short waves or if that's a translation thing. Short wave radio? Yeah, that's what I'm, or maybe just, just some sort of energy, mm -hmm. like a waveform. I refer to the world we live in. Trying to pick up information on short waves. I would say that these phenomena signal Trying to pick up information on short waves. I refer to the world we live in. Hmm. It's like they speak in parables. The next line is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> the universe we live in limits the full knowledge. See? Huh. So it's like you get to the other side and it's, it's still not, limited. Yeah, that's interesting. You might have more, but it's... Yeah, it's like a game. Mm -hmm. Life is this never-ending journey. Puzzle. Of... Uh, that's so weird. What do you just like wake up after you die one day and you're just like in this new world? Yeah. But it's still this other mystery. So you're with all these dead and you're like, what happens next? And they're like, we don't know. <laughs> it's like Beetlejuice. Well, I read through that handbook for the recently deceased. It says, live people ignore the strange and unusual. <laughs> well, there, you know, it's funny is one of these, I don't have a clip, I don't think, but it's in the documentary where a soul is asked that question or a spirit, whatever, and they say, we don't experience it this way. I think unless it was a school group, but the answer was we don't experience a death, right? We are on the other side, yeah. but our life never stopped. Oh, right. We just went to the next. Yeah, the dead look back at it. It's not like they died and then they, right. now they're the dead. It's just a continuous right. consciousness. The beginning of their life to where they are now in this quote afterlife is just still part of the same lifespan. Interesting. Just walk yeah. through a door. I always wonder that, you know, like, because I think about death a lot. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do, but I consciously do, partly because I think I've, I'm alone a lot and I spend a lot of time at home. And so it enters my mind a lot. Yeah. And I always think like, 
that split, you know, mm-hmm. I had a dream about it the other night. I always think, is it just off or like, or is it just one continuous, like you never lose consciousness. You're right. just somewhere else. Yeah. You know, it seems to be in, in um, your death experiences. It seems like a lot of the time right. there isn't an off necessarily. And then you wake up somewhere. It's more of like, right. Exactly. It's a transition. You hear more about That's confusion. A lot of the fear comes from though, mm-hmm. you know, that off feeling yeah. like you're extinguished. Obviously that's where game over, man. Yeah. And I think that's, what's so interesting about these experiments is that if this is true, then it's like looking back at the living it's just as hard for them to communicate here. It would explain why if there is life after death, you always hear there's no evidence. No one's come back and told us what's right. what's happening over there, except you do have those obviously occasions. Modern like, death science experiences. has not put a lot of resources towards looking into this stuff. Right. And I don't know if I want to jump to that right now, but that exact quote came from Bigelow who recently started up again, actually started a long time ago, but the search for the survival of consciousness. Mm-hmm. And that's one of his things that he said is like, you know, uh, there's 7.8 billion something people in the world and all of us are going to die. And we spend a strangely little amount of money to yep. look into what happens after that death. Yeah. You'd think that'd be one of the more pressing issues we'd be working on. Right. Exactly. What I was trying to say there was just that that's a good explanation for why we don't hear, you know, if my uncle still living somewhere on the other side, why doesn't he reach out? You know, why can't they? There must be nothing after death. But then it's like, if it's a lot of people that have lost people have experiences exactly, yeah. that they've felt, you know, we've had him with uncle John where mm-hmm. he's like weird things have happened right. related to him. Yeah. And, uh, but as a general whole, right. this would explain that this difficult membrane that it's even challenging for. Right. Exactly. That's the reason. It's fascinating. They don't just come and show up. They're at not your superhuman. Door. Death doesn't make you superhuman. It's really been the modern Western view that has kind of shunned death for a long time. Made you afraid of it? They don't like to think about it, and we've kind of lost the you know. Acceptance. Different cultures throughout time have had, it's been close to them all Part the time. Part of life. And maybe they knew life went on, but it was just, they had access more, I guess. Right. You know, they didn't push it so far in the back burner. And then when it happens, you're just like, it just people freak out. Right. Yeah. How do you communicate with us? Who is the catalyst? We interact with a lot of interest. Incomprehensible. It's all for us and it serves us. We are also interested in a perception to be able to work simultaneously. The human brain modifies the same ambient where we will return. So really there's a whole other life over there. And then there's groups of scientists or people like yeah. that, that just not everyone. It's just a couple of people that are like doing what they're doing. Right. Exactly. Like that, that's why it's kind of cheesy, but you mentioned the skull group. They refer to the, the people they're working with on the other side as the spirit team. Right. Yeah. And it sounds it's like so a team new agent. And- Everyone else is busy doing their life. Right. You know, whatever is on the other side. That's interesting. And that's exactly right. In the school experiments, which we'll do in the expansion, fascinating stuff because it's in England, but you have these group of people that have passed over that are communicating with them and they're acting in the same way. Also just as curious as what's going on in Italy with Bocce, trying to figure out better ways to communicate. Oh mm-hmm. yeah. And this is what I wanted to mention too too, about your mention of uh, John earlier, the um, movie Firefly and how that took place in a limited window of time because of whatever the Aurora Borealis in that movie. But in the, in this- You say Firefly? Is that what it was called? Frequency. Frequency. Firefly is that sci-fi show. But yeah, this idea that it's a limited window, you're talking about the skull experiments happening, Bocce. Bocce is still going on at the same time. Skull experiments are going on. The priests have that experience in um, 50, 52. And then- Jurgensen starts in 59, having not heard of the priest experiments because they didn't come out until the 90s. So all this stuff's happening in the last handful of decades. A lifetime, basically. Right. It's this just period where this is kind of allowed to happen or we have the technology for this to be yeah. able to happen. A person in the hall asks if the spirit entities regret life. They don't break this aspect of continuity without knowing the difference. It's all a flow and hearing that life responds entirely it's all a flow and hearing that life responds entirely weird so and some of this again could be the translation issue from italian english yeah for sure but it sounds to me like what we were just talking it's about it's continuity right? yeah the right. flow continues not really a death per se uh there's one quote that is later on you guys have seen the documentary evolution will follow where death becomes a new life until the mystery door is reached so it sounds like that door is after the next uh, realm. Yeah. Death is a corridor, right? That's soft the idea. Touch. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> and plenty of soft touches through that corridor. But yeah, fascinating stuff, guys. We'll have that full documentary link in the show notes if you don't mind reading uh, subtitles. It's really interesting. Yeah, cool. I mean, so it stuck out. with me when I saw that, I don't know how many years ago now, I saw it 10 years ago or something. 
but I remembered it and I didn't remember the details of it until we looked it up for this episode, but I remember I had to find it because it, that's how interesting I thought it was. And still, like, I mean, if you guys watch it, I think you'll really find it fascinating. I just don't know how they haven't made more documentaries on this guy. He's been doing yeah. it for decades. Yeah, it's- Especially if he hasn't been like super debunked. Like I haven't, I didn't find any material like that. I feel that. like the movie Frequency was probably based on this. It's a very similar idea. Very similar, except it was just time and not. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's the same concept though. Mm-hmm. Yeah, know, speaking, commuting through, through yeah. radio. Yeah. I think they just remade that. Why would you remake that? It was so good. And I'm pretty sure really? the remake was not great. Yeah, that's odd. It was kind of a B movie. There was actually another movie that just came out. It was like on, it was a Netflix movie. Maybe oh, that was Frequency. There was a, there was a newer one. It was that Italian just came or out. something with the guy with the parabolic microphone, like in a house. No, this was like a family that had lost their parents. Did you watch it? I, I watched like half of it. What's the idea? This kid is working on a science project mm-hmm. and is, they lose their parents, like a f- group of kids. And he has this science project that basically allows them to communicate with their parents. But I didn't get very far. It was like I went like a quarter of the way in. It was hmm. it was pretty good. I just didn't. I'm not a movie watcher. <laughs> Sounds familiar. Is it called Our House? Maybe. I didn't hear great things about it, so I didn't watch it. But yeah, it was there was definitely it could have been a little better. Skippable. There was some interesting parts, and I bet you it probably would have got better as time went on. A college student with a gizmo. Okay, we don't need <laughs> yeah, it. We don't really you don't want to hear the breakdown. <laughs> no. no, actually, we've got a stinger to play. Oh, yeah? Erica Oz. All right. Yeah, so that was the story of Marcello Bacci. I hope you guys dug it. We'll have more in the show notes for you. And some of this will linger over into the expansion. We're going to get into the fascinating stuff with the Skull Group, right, Chris? Yeah, if you're enjoying this discussion about research into afterlife and into beings being on the other side, wanting to connect with us, there's a fascinating account that happened over a five-year period in Skull in England. Oh, that's the name of the place? Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was like an acronym or something. No, and uh, it was two couples. They were mediums, and at one point they had been told by some guide or something that if they followed some certain protocols, they'd be able to communicate and further advance communication with people that have crossed over. So they took on this project of converting their cellar in this old home into basically a sanctuary of communication where they did all these experiments. They had renowned researchers come and test what was going on. They eventually took it around the world to have scientists in other countries see what they were doing. And Mm -hmm. the communications that came through were phenomenal. And um, John, we'll show you some clips and and images of that and we'll play some audio, but really mind-blowing. Definitely great story. So yeah. come over to the expansion, sign up. And to bookend this episode, we brought up Edison at the beginning of this episode. Well, John, here's a picture. And we'll get into this in the expansion, but the Skull Group, this is a piece of film that was developed under lock and key, supposedly untouched by spirit or by the other side. Its purpose was to help improve the communication device, the recording device. And they looked at the schematic and they compared the signature. They sent it to a historian at the Edison Library or something. And they verified that that is Edison's signature. The idea that Edison actually communicated with this group to improve the quality of the communication right. device. Crazy. The spirit phone being developed from the other side. Kind of an yeah. interesting concept. But we'll get more into that in the expansion, guys. And we'll have cool. pictures in the show notes. But yes, we have patrons to thank. And we have a stinger to do. Let's do the stinger first. Okay. This is for Erica Oz. Awesome. Oh, yeah. She went big. This one's for you, Erica. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Erica, you're a clinical laboratory scientist <laughs> with a corgi named Scout. You're the mother of some plants that probably have silly names, but this is just a guess because I didn't find out. Coffee, stand up comedy documentaries. Paranormal is their thing. Landscapes, animals, she's watercoloring, <laughs> cooking, traveling, she has the recipe. Her name is Erica. <laughs> the recipe. <laughs> Erica Oz. Ooh, dirty. Ooh. No one to compare it to. <laughs> He's got it all. She was made in America. <laughs> That was, that was awesome, like, like man. candy, John. That was great. <laughs> Hope you liked it, Erica. Fantastic. Yes. She commented on my music the other day. She said she found it and she liked it. And I was like, well, I'm making music for you right now. So maybe, That's sweet. maybe I'll make some more someday. Yes. That was great, man. Thanks. Good work. Yeah, I loved it. Thank you, Erica. Cool. Now on to our patron thank you. Yes. 
do it. Yeah, let's thank some patrons, guys. Or let's maybe we should. I think we keep saying patrons. Should we change the word so people aren't yeah. confused? Expansion. We have some new expansion members. All right, guys, and if you too want to be an expansion member, go to bluefull.com and click on that uh, expansion. Join the expansion button. I was going to say dirty button. Click on click that, on that dirty, dirty, button. dirty, dirty button and click join the expansion. Dirty, nasty, filthy. Yeah, jump on it because button. you guys get oh, double he's the content. So sexy. It's sexy content. It's double the content. Creepy. Double the wonderful stories and sound design and, you know, love from us. Yeah. So thanks to everybody who is already in, and we're going to read the new guys and gals now. Okay, here we go. Ready? Play that music. <laughs> there it is. I think I put this music on to sleep too at night. I have the best dreams, I think. I feel like I I'm that. like on a cruise ship or something. <laughs> Pina coladas. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you to Chris Curtis. All right. Two names again. What up, Chris? Coming up from down under, Ben Roberts. Good day, mate. <laughs> uh, Sorry, Australia. Appropriately next in the role is Kangaroo Joey. All right. Actually, oh, it's what? It's just Joey. I thought you said down under the first one. Yeah, that's Australia. Yeah. What's the next one? They're both. No, the next one's just Joey. I just added kangaroo because the baby oh, kangaroo is okay. Joey. Yeah, confused. Me. Thank you to Joey. Wow. Boing, Sorry. Boing, boing. <laughs> uh, Caden Thompson. Hey there. Caden afraid. Get out of town again. Good friend Simon von Elg. All right. What up, Simon? Get out of that camera. Molly Smith. Hey, Mal Mal. Hey, Molly. Jesse. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Ertel or Ertel. Jesse Ertel. Right. Ertel the turtle. Ertel the turtle. <laughs> it's not a compliment or anything. We are glad you are here. Kevin. He's starting to hurt. <laughs> Kevin. Just Kevin. Kevin. I love it. I love Kevin. Isn't he great? And also, thank you to Jen. Jen. Hey, Jen, Jen. Fur is the woman of the year. <laughs> Special thanks to Lindsay Maves. All right, Lindsay. Lindsay. Hey, thank you. Did we you. thank her last time? Well, thank her I'm again. still waiting for that present from you. Get out your rifle, because we're shooting a buck. Thanks to Buck. Oh, my God. Uh, what up? <laughs> so bad. What up, Buck? All right. Another great big thank you to Emily. Emily, thank hey. you. Hey, Em. Love you. Give a big old what to Melissa Kramer. Hey there. Hey, Melissa. Thanks Is that for, the one we know? Thanks for joining us. Welcome into the hall. Welcome. Stay for a while. Hold on. Let me start again. Play that music. Thank you to Madison Miller. Madison Miller, we hope you enjoyed your stinger. Na, na, na. <laughs> Thank you to Kelly Brown. Hey, Kel, Kel. Kelly. Kelly Brown. Kelly Brown. Are you a Kelly Brown? Is that you, Kelly Brown? Is that you out there? Is that you out there? Another thank you to Sherry Dixon. All right. Sherry Dixon. Not to be superseded by Sue LaRose. What up, Sue? We love you in the hole. You always write to us, and we like to read your thoughts. And great story in the last episode. Thank you to Matt Fearon. All right, Matt. Turn that fear on. Bring fear it. off. And then off. When it's, you should have a paranormal podcast. Fear off and on. Perfect name. Great thanks to Lori Fetter. Ah, oh, yes, Lori. Lori. Thank you. She's a good gal. She's great. Uh, She's from Austin, I think, or near Austin. Oh, that's true. Yes. Uh, another thank you to Lynn. Oh, hey. With an H. Lin. Lin. Is that German? H after the end. Oh, oh Lin. Hi, hi, Lin. There you go. That's better. Welcome. Uh, thanks again to Jeremy Littleton. Not too small. Thank you. Big sloppy belief hole hugs to, <laughs> to Chris and Elena Smith, who joined the expansion recently. All right. Welcome. Hugs. Welcome. 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 The hole got that much deeper. Thank you to Kochelik Burkett. Oh, hey there. I didn't pronounce that right, probably, but thank you. We had a camp counselor with your last name. That is true. Sweet. Welcome. Your family here. Also, thank you to Matthew Garcia. Hey, Matthew. Hey, Matthew. Our good friend Sasha Kendall has upped her pledge. Thank you, Sasha. Sasha, Sasha, <laughs> Sasha. Another thank you to Joseph K. Hey, Joe. What do you know? Joseph Special K. Another thank you to a name that's going to be hard to pronounce is Kaomi. Kaomi. Right. Kaomi. Hey, bud. Or lady. Or we lady. could be a gal. Yeah, you can be a bud and be a female. That's true. Either way, you're loved in the hole. Thank you to Joseph Jones, Sr. Joseph Jones. All right. Woo! Father and son team now in the Woo! hole. 
And final thanks to Amanda Coyle. Yes. Amanda. Wrap around the hole. Wait, wait, wait. And we got the best, well, not the best, but we are very sorry that we missed you. <laughs> Our super, super special friends. <laughs> super special. <laughs> Arlene. Arlene Oxton. Arlene Oxton. Thank Arlene you so Oxton. much We're for so being sorry here. We're so sorry we missed you. And we love you and are grateful you stuck around, yes. even though we forgot your name. Well, here's some belief hole lasers for you. Pew, 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 pew. And some belief hole Ow. bears. Cool. Not big. Yes. Good All right. Go. Thank you guys so much. Thanks, everybody. You keep us going. Uh, stick around, those of you in the expansion. That was abrupt. That wasn't very abrupt. <laughs> it made me very uncomfortable. Uh, those of you who are expansion members, join us in the expansion. Uh, if you're not yet, you'd like to join, go to bleeful.com and click on the big red expansion button. Get in the yes. Floor. Join us for a tale of interdimensional discovery. Yes. And conversations with those from beyond. Absolutely. Good news. This was an uplifting episode, I thought. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nice to know that life goes on. Life does go on, guys. And so does the show. It's just the show. <laughs> Come on over to the Afterlife Bleep Hole in the expansion. All right, thanks, everybody. And we will see you next time on... Is this the, a thing now? Yeah. On, on, on the Bleep Hole. Hole. All right.